Welcome to Let's Talk Geek episode 103, recorded 1st of August 2012. In the show, we talk to Leif Olof Wallen, the Research Vice President at Gartner, about current mobile trends and strategies. We also then talk about robots and the Hobbit being split into three parts. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the show, and to get us started, we have a random for today. Tim, uh, what's the random? Um, in mathematics, 103 uh, is the 27th prime number. Uh, the previous prime is 101, making them both twin primes. It is also a happy number. What's a happy number? I don't know. <laughs> Th that's next week's random. <laughs> that's next week's random. Brilliant. Finding out what happy numbers are. All right, so in the show today, uh, we have me, Jan Vermeulen. Tim Hogg. I'm Gareth Vermeulen. And we have a guest with us in the show today, um, Leif Olaf Wallen, Research VP at Gartner, who heads up mobile enterprise strategy there. Welcome, Leif. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Happy right. to be here. Cool, cool. And um, I think without f uh, further ado, we're going we're gonna to head straight into uh, some topics. So to set the scene a little, um, what's been happening in South Africa recently in the, the mobile and, and uh, you know, portable computing space is that uh, we've got a Windows 8 confirmed launch date for South Africa. So now before uh, Windows 8 was, you know, said that it would be generally available on 26 October 2012, but n it wasn't specific about which countries necessarily uh, that would include, though they said it would be uh, available in 231 countries and like 109 languages. Um, so we now have a formal comment from Microsoft South Africa saying that we will be in that first wave um, and that we will be, and that we're top tier, whatever that means, and that we're going to be getting quite a bit of love this time around. And uh, among the things that this love represents, uh, I suppose, is that we'll be able to buy the upgrade from uh, XP Vista and Windows 7 to Windows 8 Pro, um, that $40 special upgrade. Mm. We'll be able to get that from the Microsoft shop. Uh, Microsoft.com shop, but we'll be paying in US dollar. They'll just accept South African credit cards for that. Um, and we'll also be able to pay, buy, buy that special $15 upgrade if you buy between, I think, June and January or something, and you get a Windows 7 system. Oh, yeah. Then you'll be able to buy an upgrade for 15 US dollars. And um, Windows is going to, uh, they're now going to have the marketplace as well uh, for Windows 8. Um, so will we have access to that? Will we have paid access to that as well? Um, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, worth I think Windows Phone, we do. Yes, yeah, correct. so so all that stuff and, I and expect to be available. My question is, do we want Windows 8? <laughs> uh, I, a lot of the people I know that have been using it, so it's, it's, it's nice, but it's nothing... Um, I, I, I don't really want to comment. At this stage, I have been playing around with it, and, and I've got a copy of the consumer preview that I'd like to load on a, on a, a standalone system at my house. Um, it's it's cool. I think if you can if you can get the upgrade for forty dollars, no, then, it's, it's then it, it might be worth, worth it because it. it's got some really interesting features. Um, and perhaps we'll get into that a bit later. Um, so uh, and we can talk through that. Whether it's going to be worth it for you remains to be seen. I think just like XP, people are going to be staying on Windows Seven for a long time before they switch because Windows Seven is is a very functional and and, and good op yeah. solid operating system. Oh, that's my big problem. Is unfortunately I hardly ever use Windows anymore, oh. so I have no idea what what the new ones are like. Mm -hmm. Um, then another interesting uh, tidbit to, to come out uh, through the week, and, and we didn't get to cover this last week. Arthur Goldstuck from Worldwide Works, who does a lot of research and stuff in South Africa, put out his new mobility report 2012 with Dashboard and funded by FNB. And among the things that came out of that was the most popular social networks and, and uh, instant messengers in South Africa. I'll take a guess and say Mixit is on that list. Mixit's definitely on that list, okay. but it is, um, he actually pointed out uh, that it's actually interesting to note the lack of growth in Mixit this oh. time around. Um, and so for a quintessentially South African social network, um, he pointed out that there's a lot of churn in Mixit. And so what they are showing is a lot of new signups um, to compensate for that churn. But they're not growing nearly as fast as BBM, which just rocketed WhatsApp, which, which are not Apparently, strictly speaking WhatsApp social networks, like the largest. but Mixit's also just an IM. Um, WhatsApp, it depends how you rank them, but in terms of IMs, I would say WhatsApp's the largest, closely followed by Mixit. It's 26% and 23% uh, market share uh, each. And then uh, BBM uh, followed with, I think, 18% or, I uh, know, 17%. 
Um, and uh, Google Talk w was in real decline. And Facebook is obviously the most popular social network in South Africa. Okay. Uh, with 38% um, of people, of mobile users using it. Um, and Twitter is, has got 12%. Um, so to just to sort of uh, set the scene with, with where South Africa finds itself in the mobile and space. In terms, space. Of, in terms of growth, Facebook and Twitter, have they been going up, down, Facebook, stagnating? Facebook, since they measured last time, which is mm -hmm. 18 months ago in 2010, Facebook uh, went up 16%. <coughs> BBM went up 14%. Twitter went up 6%. Google Talk went down 7%. Interesting. And that makes sense because I, I don't know that many people are actually using Google Talk and there's mm. no value add that it's actually giving. Yeah. And mix it from the stats that I looked at stayed about the same. It's it's a 23, 24%, I think. Uh, so it, it basically stays stagnant, stagnant, which is a bad thing to, to be doing in mm. the online space. You grow, you die. Especially in that kind of, yeah, that kind of market. Mm. Okay. Mm. So, um, Leaf, uh, that, that's just to sort of give a sense of, of the stuff that, that we look at um, in South Africa uh, in the mobile space, and uh, and the fact that BlackBerry is so popular in South Africa, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you've been made aware of that. Um, so I just wanted to kind of set the scene there. Um, but as uh, as a, a, a guy in charge of mobile strategy at Gartner, um, what are some of the big trends uh, that for the next five years that that you've that you've spotted? Well, the the biggest trend that we're seeing, if we're talking about the the real Uber trends here. And that is how social, mobile, cloud and information is all coming together. How we're seeing the convergence between these technologies. How these technologies are changing the way uh, people are using internet as well as information technology at large. And also how we expect it to start changing how enterprises, governments and other providers of IT will have to uh, manage this. So um, if you're looking at what's happening with uh, big data, lots of information available, well, lots of that information makes sense for people that are mobile. So in the mobile context, access to information, being able to exploit moments of needs, uh, that really fuels lots of new companies, lots of new developments, and lots of new exciting things for the next five to seven years. Okay. Um, and... Uh and so what we we're talking about uh, enterprise, but um, I think that the mobile, uh, I'm going to call it a revolution because it, it has been, uh, it has been a, a massive change um, since five years ago. Uh, where are we now? 2012. What's, what's five years ago? 2007 about is where, the, is where the iPhone first came out. And all of a sudden there was this big consumer interest in smartphones. Um, but uh, but that was seemed to be driven by consumers. Um, is that an is that an accurate perception that this wave of mobile interest and uh, and uh, the amount of money being made in the space uh, is driven by consumers? Yeah, it's an it's an accurate statement. You have to keep in mind that nine out of ten smartphones is being bought by consumers. It's only about one out of ten that's bought directly by an enterprise. And also in enterprises, we're now seeing a very strong trend that enterprises are starting to support bring your own device. So the first step they did was uh, that they went from single platform, typically standardizing on the BlackBerry device, to multi-platform, allowing other devices than Blackberries uh, into the company, and now also allowing employees to bring their own device to work. Some having schemes to... Uh, compensate the end users for that, some having uh, uh, regimes in place that you can use the corporate subscription with a personal device, and some basically just say, if you don't like the corporate device, go buy your own device, but we're definitely not going to pay for it. So we, we tend to see um, big variation here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this, this balance, uh, be uh, because, I mean, Microsoft... Uh, really dominated in the PC space because of its entrenchment in, in enterprise. Um, will we see the balance in mobile devices similarly swing uh, to, to enterprise use, or will consumers still be dictating uh, who wins in the mobile space uh, for the next five years? Um, 
we've uh, seen the the last cases of where the uh, the enterprise can uh, dictate those days are gone. Um, there are some areas, of course, where, where that will still happen, sensitive parts of government, sensitive parts of defense, uh, the types of areas. But in general, uh, consumerization uh, always wins. Uh, the shiny toys always wins over the boring enterprise kit. Okay. And if you're looking at innovation... Uh, innovation always takes place in the consumer space. And then it typically takes about two years. Then there is an enterprise-grade version of that technology. And after another five years, Microsoft or SAP or somebody else will buy the technology and the company. Okay. Um, so uh, while we're on the topic, <laughs> what must companies do to ensure that they're not left behind? They need to embrace the trend. They also need to embrace uh, the, the nexus of forces that I was talking about initially, where social, mobile, cloud, and information comes together. Unless they open up their systems, unless they make information available at a greater pace, they will be at a competitive disadvantage. They will not be able to attract the top talents. They will not be able to... Uh, support innovation in the company and they will basically see other more innovative organizations uh, having their lunch. Mm -hmm. Does this include opening up um, access on your business network to something like Twitter or, or Gmail or, uh, or something like that? Um, or, or, you know, uh, is there still uh, a sensible way for companies to, to restrict access to services like that for their employees? Um, this is uh, a balance that's uh, not really new. If you uh, go back, let's say, 50 years, uh, you had the same type of discussion about uh, the phone. Should the phone only be used for company calls? Uh, should you be allowed to do the occasional personal call on the device during working hours and things like that? It's, um, it's just the same thing all over again. Mm. Should you be able to do uh, social media, personal things on your corporate laptop or not? Um, I, I don't really see uh, much difference. I'm just seeing that uh, this will change over time. And uh, one of the biggest things that needs to happen is that more organizations need to uh, start moving to uh, really looking at what uh, the employees are contributing, uh, the result of their efforts, not uh, evaluating them based on if they look like they're working when a manager is passing. Mm -hmm. <coughs> mm, excuse me. Um, so um, now, uh, while, while we're uh, uh, you know, not focusing on the consumer side of things, um, governments, um, you know, to, to catch this, this wave um, of, uh, you know, of, of things swinging towards mobile and, and, uh, and just mobiles, you know, uh, dominating in the marketplace, um, what do governments and countries need to do to ensure that they aren't left behind competitively compared to the rest of the world? Well, there are lots of things to do. One is to make uh, uh, the, the landscape truly competitive. And uh, I had the pleasure of being in South Africa for a week, uh, both Cape Town, Joburg, Pretoria in March, uh, speaking to lots of our clients. Um, I also had uh, the unfortunate of racking up a total usage of 154 megabyte of data when I was in South Africa. When I got back home, I was slapped with an 18,000 rand phone bill from yeah. my uh, local provider. Oh, so yeah. it's, it's, it's things like that that needs to be fixed. The competitive landscape needs to be uh, uh, encouraged to uh, lower the prices and uh, increase usage. Um, overall, in South Africa, mobile data, both for domestic as well as roaming use, is too expensive. Um, and that's one of the... Uh, probably the main reason why you're seeing BlackBerry being uh, unproportionately popular in South Africa. It's really only two markets where they are still uh, showing healthy growth and healthy numbers. It's South Africa and India. And both of them, both these two markets have uh, uh, pricing that's out of whack. So, of course, if you have something that offers uh, what seems to be free messaging, when messaging is expensive and data usage is expensive, um, that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So... 
fixing those kind of things, that's one thing. Another thing that's, of course, to use mobile technology in a way to uh, uh, both get closer to the citizens, uh, all sorts of different citizen services, and, of course, also to uh, use it constructively to, uh, in education. Mm-hmm. Um, now, now, you mentioned the, the disproportionate... Um, you know how disproportionately well BlackBerry is doing in South Africa compared to to the uh, to the other manufacturers, and it's disproportionate in the sense that Android and and iOS um, or, or Apple stuff, uh, Apple and Google stuff, are doing so much better than BlackBerry elsewhere in the world. Um, is this a trend that you that you think uh, will continue? That it's going to be Android and iOS uh, duking it out over over dominance with Apple and Samsung the the dominant players there. Uh, we believe um, this will continue for a while, but um, the uh, new and quick grower on the block will be uh, Windows Phone that's based on Windows 8. So when that um, gets released, we expect to see Windows Phone market share uh, growing and on a global basis uh, that Windows Phone will be bigger than Apple iPhone by uh, 2015. Okay, interesting. Um, what what uh, what do you base that what do you base that prediction on? Uh, we're seeing uh, uh, basically three things here. One is that uh, Windows Phone is heavily backed by Nokia. Yes, Nokia is in uh, serious trouble from a financial perspective, uh, but they are a, the biggest phone manufacturer on the planet. They have a very uh, aggressive supply chain and they have the capability of providing Windows phones at different price points and uh, have a fairly strong brand name in in lots of uh, geographies. So the Nokia affiliation is one uh, critical success factor. The the other one is that uh, we tend to see uh, Microsoft in a position where they can't really uh, afford to lose this fight. Uh, They will uh, open the, the funding, the marketing money to make this successful. So we, we believe they will uh, do everything in their power to make sure that Windows Phone with the uh, Windows 8 based release gets very successful. Mm. And the third one is that uh, from an enterprise perspective, we, we tend to see lots of play in enterprises where they value the integration to uh, the other Microsoft backend platforms. It's a very little known fact that uh, Windows Phone 7.5, the Mango release, is the only uh, operating system for smartphones that actually uses uh, the privileges of the documents that they have in Exchange and SharePoint. So um, it, it will get some enterprise play. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it is interesting to, to note uh, one, of the, one of the previous articles I didn't mention that came out of uh, Arthur Goldstock's uh, Arthur Goldstock's report um, is that Nokia, uh, despite you know sh- doing poorly uh, and selling poorly elsewhere in the world, their position has remained dominant in South Africa. In fact, I think they increased their market share from a very high base um, to I think a fifty or a fifty-one percent market share in South Africa in 2012. So uh, in South Africa, at least, uh, Nokia is doing incredibly well overall. Uh, I mean, obviously that's because of their lower end handsets. Um, but uh, but it is it was interesting to see how well they did they did locally and it's it's interesting to to hear you like you you uh, tying Nokia's uh, brand name uh, to to Windows Phone success. Uh, oh yes, and we're also starting to see uh, uh, Nokia helping uh, Microsoft to push down the the envelope of Windows Phone so that Windows Phone can run on. Uh, less heavily specced hardware, which is uh, really needed to get into the price ranges that's attractive in, let's say, South Africa and other countries. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Microsoft uh, not so recently uh, announced uh, Windows 8, and they've now recently announced launch dates for the new operating system, and they've also announced a tablet-optimized version of Microsoft Office, which uh, the media have taken to calling Office 2013. Um, How big a deal are these uh, uh, pieces of software for Microsoft and for the market in general? 
Well, if we uh, look at uh, Microsoft, we started to see this shift a number of years ago. They made Office available for the uh, Mac uh, for many, many years now. Uh, we've seen them porting uh, uh, Office uh, onto the Nokia Symbian platform. So uh, for Microsoft to uh, continue to increase the uh, potential uh, license base makes perfect sense. Uh, they need to do it. Uh, it's, uh, it was really crazy for them to let uh, docs to go and uh, quick office and these types of guys uh, getting all that revenue. So, yeah, it makes sense for them to decouple more from the underlying base operating system moving forward. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Windows 8, um, do you think that will get uh, much traction on desktops and on tablets? Uh, Windows 8 is uh, really the first operating system where we see uh, potential true convergence between uh, media tablets and PCs, uh, with uh, the potential of um, a media tablet being sort of a tablet when you're uh, around and about. And then when you get into the office, you can dock it and you can get access to more accessories and uh, increase productivity. So uh, it's the first type of scenario where um, users can get away from the three screen scenario that they currently have. Uh, a small screen being a smartphone, a big screen being a PC, and the tablet being sort of in between. Mm. But for all intents and purposes, uh, we, we really expect to see um, Windows 8, especially in the enterprise, to be a little bit slow uh, when it comes to uptake. Uh, lots of our clients have uh, finally made the leap from XP to uh, Windows 7, and uh, we don't really expect to see lots of them having an appetite to move directly to Windows 8 after just finishing a Windows 7 migration. So there is, uh, there is a high likelihood that in the enterprise area that Windows 8 will be a little bit like Vista. It would be sort of an in-between uh, version that uh, many enterprises might skip. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, um, I haven't actually looked at this. What's the market share looking like for XP still? Um, it, it, it has it, been shrinking. It's been uh, shrinking, with, with but it's still seven. fairly high, correct? Um, uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a valid question. Because, How, well, what I'm getting at is do you, do you think that um, people will be jumping from XP to Windows 8 um, and skipping Windows 7? Um, very, very few. Um, if you're looking at when um, the support... Uh, drops for XP, there isn't, there isn't really any time to do a Windows 8 migration and plan a Windows 8 migration. It's really not a feasible uh, option to most of our enterprise clients. They have to go to 7, and most of them have either gone to 7 or are planning to go. about to complete that migration. Okay. Interesting. Um, and... Uh, and as a as a consumer device, um, as you said, uh, you know the Windows 8 is sort of moving away from from three screens to to two screens. Um, is that something that you that you think will will also get traction? That that people might trade in their laptop uh, for a tablet, so they carry a tablet and a smartphone rather than a laptop and a smartphone, or a laptop, a tablet, or, or and a smartphone. Potentially a tablet with a dock, or mm. potentially. Um, we've seen this form factor before with Asus, and I've always loved the Asus pad phone. Um, do you think that they might logically, from this current setup, um, with the laptop, or well, with a tablet that they dock, do you think they'd make a logical step from there to having a phone that they dock into a tablet that they can dock, and it becomes your your laptop or your PC? A lot of questions. Uh, I'm, uh I'm more positive when it comes to um, having a tablet with a larger battery and larger capacity and being able to sort of transform that into a more capable device than, uh, than having a phone. Uh, if we're looking at uh, phone and tablet together, there's too much overlap with, with batteries and stuff like that, and the weight becomes a restriction. So I'm, I'm not so positive about that combo. I'm more positive about um, tablets being uh, uh, extensible. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, then um, I think the 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 last question uh, I wanted to ask you is: Is there what is the the, the thing in this space that um, uh, yeah, that most interests you? Uh, uh, 
for that, that you that that you find will be the most interesting thing to happen in in the next five to ten years well from a volume perspective the most interesting thing will be the the internet of things uh, so if we're looking at uh, uh, towards uh, 2015 uh, we'll, we'll start seeing an increased number of um, devices in the mobile networks that are not phones. By 2020, we expect to see as many of these non-phone devices as phones in the networks. So um, what the mobile operators are starting to do now, since uh, they've sold SIM cards to almost uh, everybody uh, that's a living uh, person, human being, uh, the next thing is to uh, start populating uh, devices with SIM cards and even animals. Do, do you think um, the open hardware movement, guys like um, Arduino, uh, Arduino, Arduino and, and those guys will have a role to play there? Uh, what's key in those types of environments is to have a, an ultra small footprint. So yes, that would uh, typically make an awful lot of sense. Yes, absolutely. Cool. Um, I, yeah. yeah, I just had a question. It's more you're talking about as time is going by, you, the, the, these huge volumes of data obviously coming through into the cloud and big data and the rest of it, and with the mobile phones being gr great methods to view the data, but not very good for processing or. or or working with the dog because you know they've got limited capabilities. Are, are you seeing any interesting tools out there for for sort of processing this these large volumes of data into the form factor of, of a handset, or is it still now fairly custom made software to, to do that? I think it's important to to see this. Uh, well, you, you have to focus on the truly mobile context of the user. Not everything is relevant to a user when they are truly mobile. Um, what we typically tend to see is that uh, it's only a subset of information mm -hmm. that's really interesting when you are mobile. And making that subset available, um, that makes an awful lot of sense. So uh, when we look at the top 10 technologies that our clients have to worry about in 2012, Mobile is the number two. The number one technology is uh, business intelligence and analytics. And uh, we definitely see um, that these two uh, go hand in hand. One of the hottest areas right now for mobile application developments, that's to deploy uh, dashboards to executive management teams so that they are able to uh, look at key performance indicators in the business wherever they are, whenever they are, and having access to that uh, condensed information. Cool. Mm. Um, and then we were, uh, we were asked by one of our viewers um, to, to uh, just examine... Um, uh, a, a previous uh, quote uh, from one of the, the other people at Gartner uh, and just ask you about it. Um, and uh, the, the, the quote, you must have seen it on, on ZDNet, was uh, Windows 8 for mobiles, in a word, great or good. Um, uh, Windows 8 on tablets, sorry, I like this thing. And Windows 8 on desktops, in a word, bad. Um, is that a general feeling, um, uh, or, or is that a is that a more personal thing? Well, uh, I don't recollect seeing any uh, quote where or one of my colleagues have said that Windows 8 on a desktop is bad. Um, it's a totally new user experience. Uh, we're talking about uh, breaking binary compatibility, so um, everything needs to be redeveloped for for the new. Uh, uh, operating system, but uh, that there is uh, definitely some uh, some merit to that. It it provides a lot of benefit in the tablet space and benefit in the uh, uh, smartphone space. But it's uh, it's a step forward, uh, especially in the UI uh, for the big screen as well. And uh, if you're looking at what at least enterprises really want. Uh, they want to have uh, the, the same type of uh, user experience uh, on all the screen sizes. They want to have the same policies applied across the board. Uh, they, they do want the homogeneity um, of the uh, experience. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to, to uh, add a comment there. I'm looking at the ZDNet article now. And at the bottom of the article, uh, the article quotes Gunnar Berger. Uh, Gartner's research director, but at the bottom of the article it says the bad claims were retracted 
um, and he explained that his words were taken out of context. Um, so, uh, yeah, just to just to bring closure to that. Um, then the, the the one last thing um, I wanted to ask from my side is: um, sh- d- Do Android and uh, iOS need to respond to what Microsoft is doing in the tablet space, uh, or even in the the smartphone space? Um, is uh, it do- does uh, Microsoft present a, a danger? to them that they need to address right now? Um, Probably more a danger to uh, Android compared to uh, Apple and uh, iOS. Uh, If you're looking at uh, Apple and the tablet space, they have a very, very strong position, and we expect them to continue to be uh, very strong for the next uh, two to three years. So uh, Microsoft will take a little bit of market share out of uh, predominantly Android. Cool. Um, if there are no more questions uh, from the IRC and none more from the forum, none more from Twitter, um, then uh, Lee Foloff, I would like to thank you for your time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Do you, does you just want to any mention any websites? Or um, y- yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, but yeah, before we sign off, um, uh, if uh, if d- are you on Twitter or on Google Plus or anything like that where people can follow you? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm on Twitter, and I'll be back in person in South Africa last week of um, uh, this month for our symposium in Cape Town. Cool, cool. Yeah, we'll definitely make a mention of that in our events section as well. Um, your, your symposium is, uh, uh, is at, the, at, the end of, um, at the end of August, have I got yep. it right? 28th to 30th of August. Okay, great. Um, and it's in Cape Town at the International uh, Convention Center there, right opposite the Western, I think. Um, great. And uh, is there, is there uh, any, any closing thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Well, uh, the, the government has a pretty significant responsibility here to make sure that the, the market behaves and uh, the evolution continues. Yeah, yeah, I hope they, they put more effort. Yeah, yeah preach it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. We really yeah, appreciate you your, much time. For your time. Thank you. You're most welcome. It's been a pleasure. Cool, thank you. Okay, and right. uh, with that, I would like to uh, go into our uh, a more Start regular the show. show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, um, no, uh, no, you, you can. Okay, so we've got uh, events coming up. So as we mentioned, um, uh, the, uh, the Gartner Symposium to uh, focus on meeting the challenges of extreme information management will be from the 28th to the 30th of August 2012 in Cape Town at the International uh, Convention Center there. The NAG LAN tickets have been announced. They were announced today, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. And we've A couple been, of days ago. Uh, and we've been reminding you guys for months now to stand ready for this. So if, this you're, Saturday. Yeah, if you are watching the live stream, you will probably be warned. Maybe if the show goes live on Friday and you watch it on the day it gets released, you will get enough warning. But the tickets will go on sale through CompuTicket on oh, fail. Saturday morning. It's always CompuTicket. Oh, fa- <laughs> uh, but their new system. <laughs> oh, there are going to be 5,000 people complaining about this one. Yep, yep, yep. But there it is. It's this Saturday, the 5th of August. They didn't give a time. Um, which is I'm looking kind at of the irritating. article now. Uh, there was no time in the article. Not yet. So, yeah, so they haven't given a time yet. So it might be midnight. Yeah. It might be midnight on Friday. Um, we'll, 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 we'll keep you Break out the monsters. Via Twitter or the Google Plus or something. We'll figure out a way to let you guys know how to buy these tickets. Because oh. last year, they sold out in four hours. So watch the press. We've been told to be more active on Twitter. Okay, cool. But I'm sure my broadband and my gaming, especially... My gaming will definitely... definitely I I, I would follow that one more than anything else because they must be going to find out before, way before we we do. (laughs) Uh, Possibly, or at least they'll spot the press release before we do. Um, Yeah, so uh, do look out for that. Don't say you haven't been warned. These tickets sell out quickly. Um, As I understand it, the land will be bigger but I still think these tickets will sell out in four yeah. hours because I think of the, the Compu ticket system. Um, hopefully they should be putting in more things to stop scalpers, which I know they're worried about. Um, so, But I think last year was two hours. Oh, was it two hours, not four? What now? I think it was two hours last year. Yikes. Yikesy, yikesy, yikes. All right, so 
Uh, that's uh, that's it for our events section, I think. Um, so uh, we've got some quick news that we want to blast through for you guys. First up is uh, Outlook.com has opened for signups. Microsoft uh, has decided Hotmail is not so hot anymore. And they've announced their new competitor to Gmail, yeah. Outlook.com. So Sign-ups go opened yesterday, I think. So yes. you've probably already missed your handle, but you can still go and try and register it if you yeah, want to. I think in the first day, they had something like a million, was it one million sign-ups or something? The, the thing about these crazy. social systems, that uh, and, and email is like one of the first social systems. Let's, let's get real here for a second. It might be web 0.5, but it was social, okay? Um, is that when, when it hits the mainstream, uh, then people just... Clamber on well, top of one another to register their nicknames. Yeah, you, you learn just to grab it before anybody else grabs it. Yeah. I went and grabbed my nickname, but I'm probably never going to use it. Yeah. yeah. Then, in answer to uh, Stir Kinnikor, I just yes. did want to say this though. Apparently, they've increased the mailbox size to effectively unlimited. Well, things. isn't that the same as kind of uh, what Yahoo Mail does, or Y Mail, or whatever one actually calls that? Um, effectively unlimited. And, I mean, Google is now, s- Gmail is sitting at, what, 25 gigs? Ask people who have hit that limit. Wow. Is okay. it 25 gigs? It's 25 gigs if you get extra storage. No, isn't it sta- by standard, I think, is now 25 gigs. Yeah, I'm, I'm very sure as a Google Apps account holder, it's 25 gigs. No, not, not as a Google Apps. It's 25 gigs with the Google Apps account holder for yes. education. No, no, yes. no. I've got 25 gigs. Google tells me all the time, I think. But Which education it, is also 25 gigs. You, you, you get the, f- the free account. Okay. But I only get 10 accounts as a free yes. user. Anyway, the, the, the bottom line is uh, that, that it's out there and it's big. And Google gives you lots of storage. Microsoft gives you lots of storage. Choose your weapon. Yeah. So an interesting uh, question from IRC is, does it look like Outlook 2010? And the answer is no. It looks better than that. And in fact, I wish they'd used this interface for Office 2013. Um, Because (coughs) Outlook for tablets in Office 2013 looks a lot like normal Outlook. And um, Mm. and I asked them about this, and maybe I should I should um, we should talk about this a little more in depth. I I got to go um, at a later stage, but I got to go to San Francisco when they announced Office 2013. Yes, I'm bragging, uh, Jen. Bastard. (laughs) And um, and I I asked them about this because. Office 2013 looks a lot like Office 2010. Where, where were we? Office 2010? Yeah, I think was so. the previous yeah, one. That's, that's um, the latest. Just with bigger buttons, and you know, it's a little easier to hit them as a touch on a touch interface. And when I asked them about this and asked them why it's not, you know, more Metro, more Windows 8 optimized, as it were, um, they said that the reason they did, they did experiment with a whole, uh, you know, a lot of different look and feels for Outlook, and in the end, you know, based on the feedback they got. They, they realize that they can't muck with it too much because uh, people in enterprises spend 33% of their time in Outlook. So they, they, can't, they can't muck with it too much for so fear much of alienating their users. Getting in and out quickly. Well, well people in, in corporate situations use the See, email a lot. And there's the problem that I'm having with Windows 8 on tablets is they had to compromise on one UI because they have these two, they have this desktop paradigm and they have this Metro. So if they decided on Metro, they could have made a Metro version of Outlook from the ground up. But so, they, and it would have fit in with the new UI. But they do do but that for some apps, to, though. Exactly, for, for some browsers. apps, but they can't do it for Outlook. So they can't have two UIs because you're stuck with desktop and Metro. So if they just decided on Metro, they could have used a Metro interface. If they just and I have another desktop, question. How can you convince everybody interface. else that they have to use Metro when you don't? Um, well, you don't have to convince them. What do you mean? Well, I mean, you can just use what you want. No, no, but a lot of developers and stuff, they're convincing this Metro uh, is oh going yeah, to be yeah. for everything and it's going to be the be all and end all and all your new apps must, you mm. wanted them in Metro because it's a solution, except no, we can't do it. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the thing here is that the transitions need to be gradual. Yeah, uh, and, and it's one and thing they, you've got to learn the hard way they, is that you can't be too ahead of your time. And they can't do then it your stuff like a, a drastic transition with their office applications on well, desktop, at least. They, they can't make that bigger leap just yet. Yeah, anyway, we, because I, they'll, anyway, I mean, yes, that's a big we, 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 We've getting said stuck. quite a lot. I did want to mention, though, that um, when I did raise this point, they did say, no, but hang on a second. We did add some Metro stuff at the bottom um, for when you switch between contacts and calendar and stuff in Outlook. Um, that's, you know, that looks like a more Metro style toolbar. It looks really out of place. Um, but yeah, that said, um, talking about revamping user interfaces, New Metro has answered Stokinikor's app with a new mobile site. Uh, Which I, 
I, I haven't looked at it yet, but um, I have. Just it is really nice. It looks really it's nice. It's a better it, answer it, than it, an it, app, especially considering the Stokinico app is only on the Samsung well, store. It was even better. And by the way, the Stokinico app breaks all the time. Um, Big surprise. <laughs> as in, whenever I check, can I please just say, sorry, no, can't, can't get your data down. Fantastic. Anyway, this thing, it worked on my phone first time off. It detected, asked for location, gave me location. I then said, I Cinema, want to see yeah, cinemas. And it went to Kaltain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was awesome. So, someone at the office actually had this question. What new me- where are the new metro cinemas in Kaltain besides, I know of Menlin and I know of Monte Cassino? Hatfield? Stadland? Hatfield. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. I'll, I'll you continue a bit and I will <laughs> tell you. Is, is Hatfield new metro? Yeah, Hatfield's okay. new metro, Stadland. But yeah, they, they are not plentiful. And are they any good? Because um, I was recently at uh, Monte Cassino in Il Grande and I was majorly disappointed. That's just because you're jaded. Some of the ones, are, look, it's anyway. Some of the Sukiniko ones are, 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 are bad. Okay. Some with all of them, you, you get you get good and bad. So the, okay, the, this the was mixer, Il Grande. Mixer, this was supposed yeah. to be the premier of premier New Metro cinemas. The mixer has also indicated that the sound in Il Grande during the Batman premiere was bad. Um, that's the Dark Knight Rises, by the way. Um, so um, I watched it at Menlin in their main cinema, Cinema Ten. Is Menlin and any it was, good and now? And, at and, least? and it was fine. Because it used to be fairly terrible. No, it, it was fine. I mean, you still have younglings uh, all right. okay, bobbing around. That, that's with any cinema. Um, just going through all ones. Bedford, Clearwater Mall, Empress, Hatfield, Hyde Park, Lakeside Mall, Menon Park, Monte Cassino, The Glen. Cool. Okay. So we actually have quite just a few. If so much for quick interface. news. I, I like, I must say the interface. I'm <laughs> I, I, can, I, I predict this is going to be an hour and a half show. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so much for quick news. But last quick news topic, Mwebs launched Talk, which is a VoIP client, which Tim has used. No, well, no, Tim has attempted I've to use. signed up. I've done it. I then it's one of the interesting things I must say they do is with the app when you when you sign up the uh, SMS you could put your number in the SMS you a link which gives you a number. Um, you then go to the Google Play Store and you download the thing. You put the number in. You don't have to put your username and password in, which is actually exactly what WhatsApp does. Except WhatsApp automatically detects that as soon as you sign, you you punch in your number. An SMS is sent no, to the device. You don't actually receive w- the wait, notification. Wait. Does WhatsApp Cancels? make voice calls? Th- this this, well, no. this <laughs> is a, vo- a separate VoIP number. Right. But it, it's the same. That What I'm getting at is it's the same authentication mechanism, except a little bit more backwards. No, no, but this, remember, your, the number they're giving you can run on several appliances. Yes, sure. So what, what I'm, I was getting at, it's the same auth mechanism. Yeah, okay. But I'm saying I could run this VoIP app on two separate phones. They can't register it by cell phone number. Yeah. Yeah, so right. there the, the are reasons for this, but it also sets it up. The problem is I've tried the Mac app and I've tried the uh, Tim Android, Android app. I have a Mac, <laughs> yes. And by the way, I'm I not. I, uh, wait, 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 wait. I'm not going to say this is the best PC ever, like somebody else in another tech show said recently. It's a good PC for what I needed. It it is. Well, you don't have a Retina. I didn't attack all micro you. requirements. No, no. <laughs> um, I had very specific what requirements. What is your run at? I'm gonna let's whip out. Let's whip out. Okay, really guys, really. no, we're not even going there. <laughs> I'm not talking about, uh, you know, I'm not going on and about it. it it's, it's a PC. Um, it's a sweet PC. Very like, nice PC. I like the multi-touch trackpad. And so much keyboard. for the segue. <laughs> M-Web talk. Okay, so didn't work. S- so didn't, didn't work. work. Couldn't make calls. Couldn't do anything. Uh, look, I tried this fairly soon after I'd signed up, and I imagine they've got lots of people signing up at the moment. So I'm going to give them a day or two, um, and I then I'll recheck. I found it to be incredibly temperamental whenever I've tried it. OpenWave had a SIP service that I couldn't get working. Um, I, I just can't get SIP working. The Maybe I've got an anti-SIP field. The, the thing we've realized with SIP, because we use SIP in our offices quite a bit, you've got to apply shaping on your lines, and you've got to actually shape yourself down. This is M-Web, they've got shaping down. No, no, <laughs> but apparently M-Web's got in shape. So if you've got an M-Web ADSL account, it should work very nicely because they've guaranteed the SIP. Um, and that's the problem is normally when you're going with most ADSL providers, the SIP has not been guaranteed. So if you, you know, and you're in a big office and somebody starts downloading or doing anything, your SIP dies very quickly. It needs a fairly constant bit rate to work. Um, so I'm going to test it. We're going to see. Mm-hmm. Which brings us into the, the first topic of the show that I wanted to talk about um, that we had to skip over so that uh, we could chat to, to Leaf as, as long as possible. Um, the Hobbit will be split into three movies. And I see whoever put this in the show notes is probably Tim. It might have been me. Put a frowny face there. Why, why a frowny face? Three Hobbit movies sounds great. Oh, no, no. Okay. They're taking two and splitting it into three. Okay. I don't know uh, if you've seen The Hobbit when compared to Lord of the Rings. It's not e- is it the size of one of those no, tomes? It it's not even that book. 
uh, it's not even the size of one book, and they're splitting that small thing into three movies. Dude, they have like 16 dwarves worth of genealogies to go through. That's like one movie on its own. They don't have to, this isn't the Silmarillion. This is the Hobbit. Yeah. In, in, the Hobbit was actually fairly in, in, good when it came to focusing on story. In, in the words of one of the Inklings uh, commenting on a, a reading of J.R.R. Tolkien's work, oh, no, not another bloody elf. <laughs> yes. Now, now, having said that, apparently they've already finished recording. So I, I tried to read the article and it was a bit confusing because part of it sounds like they're going to do more recording to make a third one. But that means you're going to have to get to... My assumption is more they they've taken the two movies they're going to now make th- make them to three so now they can throw off three DVDs you're gonna have to go buy three tickets all in 3D it's 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 just to me f- and I, I I love Lord of the Rings I'm gonna go watch these movies I'm gonna love them it just feels like they're gouging me for money mocking you yes and that's why I said funny face um, they could have fitted it, fitted it into two movies of two and a half hours long. Or whatever. And they lost me when they mentioned who the director was. Well, what's lo- wrong with Peter Jackson? No, we know what's wrong with Peter Jackson. Let's not go there okay. because anyway. that's a fairly niche view. I think most people <sighs> like Peter Jackson. Anyway. Okay. So uh, another cool thing uh, that Tim put into the show notes is yes. that Will Shatner and Will Wheaton. It is William Shatner. William Shatner. Yeah. William, William Shatner. Shatner. I've never heard him called Will Shatner. Will though. Shatner and Will Wheaton because it sounds cool. Um, narrate the Mars rover landing. Uh, and it's called Curiosity Seven Minutes, Minutes of, of Terror. Terror. They should totally have gotten uh, Will Smith in there as well. Morgan Freeman. What? Yes. Oh. A- anyway, th- these are basic p- p- promotional recordings, that videos that they've done. To basically, they're going to go out and show all the things they've done, and they talk about the the, the seven minutes of the landing as part of it, and all why it's so terrible and how why this is so great. And look, it, it's William Shatner's voice. <laughs> Uh, and we'll, 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 I've actually heard a short of it. Well, uh, look, Will Shatner always sounds great with his voice. His voice just makes anything sound good. Uh, what was nice about... The mixer is chirping with something. Well, well, the mixer I was feels that's that Will Wheaton's set. version is better. Uh, I actually also agree with it because Will Wheaton, when you hear him, he's excited about it. It's not this stay deep. It's, you can see here he's actually keen and he's excited. And, and it depends. So you actually should listen to both and make up your own mind. So uh, something... To add to the events section, but we were going to talk about it in the show anyway, and it's not going to—it's going to be too late to add it to the events section next week. Is that Curiosity is due to land 6 August 2010, 2012, 2010 happened already, um, at 7:31 in the morning South Africa time. So that's next Monday morning. If you want to watch it, 7:31. Oh man! It's it's on the NASA, NASA Ustream channel. Or via the NASA website. So if you want to go check that out, we wanted to give you adequate warning. Um, yeah, uh, the the it'll the link will be in the show notes, and we'll paste it into the chat now. But it's kind of useless to you, <laughs> to, to to the guys in IRC. But we're going to spam it at you anyway. Cool. Then cut it. Insta Wi-Fi. What was your involvement in this deal? Uh, I was actually uh, a beta test. The guy climbed onto Reddit, so uh, slash our Android, and he went, Reddit, I have this cool idea for an app, but I need beta testers. So you're like totally uh, invested. You've got, you've got uh, invest, vested interests in this. Yes, thing. absolutely. Oh, okay, I've got a question. What does this do? Because I swear I've, uh, I've used an app like this before. Like, Johan had one about a year ago. Okay. Perhaps. Listen Maybe. to what it does. Um, this one lets you share Wi-Fi networks via QR code, which is one way. And via or or via NFC, so you can take your phone, which is already connected to the Wi-Fi, take another phone. So some dude comes over to your house, he wants to climb on your Wi-Fi, tap them together with NFC, and the other guy who knocked the mic there, and the other guy is now connected to your Wi-Fi okay. network. My question with this: Does do do both phones need instant Wi-Fi to make it work? Yes, but it's a free application on the Google Play Store. Okay. So they no, both I, need I, I, they both need to be Android phones. Um, I don't think he hasn't mentioned any kind of involvement with trying to do it for iPhone because while well, NFC is not there yet. And we'll it uses Android version. Beam. Uh, well, it uses NFC. It, it, um, it's not necessarily Android Beam. Well, it does, the, it does the NFC thing and then you use Android Beam to send it, right? Well, that's with the recent update. That's, okay. with, that's in Jelly Bean. Um, so this is not a Jelly Bean specific application. It's ice cream sandwich. Um, yeah, uses NFC. It's very handy. Um, when I actually started beta testing, I started beta testing with my Nexus S, and then I got the uh, S3, and I tested it with that for, for the guy, and then I got the Galaxy Nexus, and figured, hey, why not? Let's test it with that. Look, so I just uh, yeah. lobbed all the phones at him and, and you know, gave him 
I think it's quite a cool app, but I remember there was an app that we used about a year. Let's ask you how about it. Mm. But it was that you, you, you basically, it was more like a social thing. So you could sign up. So they had a QR code to give him yours. And then you could, from that, you could then pull his name down and say, I want to share these Wi-Fi hotspots that I have on my phone. Oh, interesting. Um, what, what I've also done before is um, the barcode scanner app for Android, which actually comes pre-installed on some Android devices. Mm. Um, they have uh, a web page where you can punch in your Wi-Fi details. So you give it the access point name, the type of security, and you punch in the password. And it generates a QR code. Um, so then you can just print that out and actually stick it up somewhere and people come to your house, scan the QR code. That's and then very that, nice, yeah. yeah it, it worked pretty well. Well, even if you've, if you've got a store and you want to change your, your code every, every week, it's quite an easy way to do it. Exactly, yeah. Yo. Hello. Okay. Right. Uh, so That's um, that one. That then uh, there's a Jurassic Park that's being built for real, for realsies, out in Australia. Thankfully, not anywhere near us. Is this guy, is this robotics? No, or is this real one. They want to clone a dinosaur because they, they have been talking about cloning dinosaurs. I know they're starting sure. with a Willy Mammoth recently, oh. um, using a elephant as a surrogate and bit of things there, but they've still got to get all the DNA. But mm. I think this is a bit of a long-term project, but I think he wants to start um, creating these things. Uh, dinosaurs from DNA and releasing it in his resort in Kowloon, Queensland. Um, look, this whole thing about Jurassic Park, you know, it's not they're not frogs and suddenly they're going to all mutate into females and all the rest of it. Um, and I'm sure they're only going to really do the really large ones. You mean that they were all females and they mutated into... I thought they were all males and they mutate into females. <laughs> One way or the other, whichever. They're not going to suddenly mutate, you know, on, on with, with sizes this large. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, great story, you know, real life will be different. But look, this is so far away. There's so many complications to solve. Um, if we, we have this technology, it's not the dinosaurs I'd be worried about. It's all the other interesting things they're going to be doing with it. Oh, okay. And just so that we know, it, the one they shouldn't be cloning, or they should be cloning very, very... Um, just don't clone Velociraptors. Yeah, just yeah. don't clone Velociraptors, and, and, please. And, and if you really want to go... see what happens. Go, go search XKCD for, for Velociraptors. He's got a whole bunch of survival things y in there. He has them all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so... Um, one last thing that you've been playing with, uh, Gareth, is Pushover. Yeah. So um, that's a, is that an app just for Android? I'm actually not sure. It might be one for iOS. Okay. Uh, I honestly haven't checked because I don't really use iOS that, that often. I but do have a device that I test games on every now and again. But, but basically I've it lets you send a push notification to your device. Yes. Uh, it, it has a fairly simple um, REST API that, that you can use, and you can send a push notification from pretty much anything that you can script. You can send that push notification to your mobile phone. So to your Android device, even your tablet or whatever. It is a paid application, but they were on, uh, it was on special for a bit for something like a buck. So I went, yeah. well, you know, it's a dollar. Who cares? Um, let's, try quickly, it. let's try it. And then I quickly wrote uh, a shell script for my torrent client. Um, and then you, you set uh, it's Ubuntu, so the default torrent client. And then you set the torrent client to when it's finished to just let me know um, that you're done. And I it had worked. that up and running. Yeah, that was the same evening that I bought it. Yeah, I also, I also actually showed you I bought it because something else recommended it. Mm. Um, I think I, it was I this I, if this then how that. Do I know? Exactly, it's, you can plug it's it kind in. of like. But now, yes, that that was the the big thing. That's why they ran the special. Is you is if this then that now plugs into pushover. So you can do things with if this then that and send a pushover notification to your phone, which is brilliant. Um, so I, so I, I still I'm need to tie this into stuff, but it it's such a simple way mm. of doing it. I don't know why I haven't heard of this before. So there's a really cool, really geeky thing to go and hack with. And go and, play. And do things. Go, go and irritate make, yourself. Make it do things and then blog stuff and send it to us so that we can talk about the awesome things you're doing with Pushover. And if this, then that. Yes. I wanted to add what? a couple more things. Sorry. Uh, something we were talking about XKCD. Um, there's a new thing in XKCD called What If. Oh, his what if series. Um, which is awesome. So if you yeah, haven't he, read it. He takes some really unplausible situation and explores what would happen if that, situ or if, if, if that type of thing actually were to occur. And he answers questions. So possible. email him about questions. Uh, I, I see this new one that I haven't read is the robot apocalypse. What if there was a robot apocalypse? How long would humanity last? 
Cool. And he, he's not just pulling things out of thin air. Um, he looks at it with physics. Yes. With science. The uh, way uh, X, only XKCD the, can the, do it. The first one is he looks at a pitcher throwing a, a uh, I want to say basketball, uh, 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 baseball, baseball, baseball at the speed of, speed of light. Yes. Um, and then he talks so about awesome. that and how basically and it's going to blow up the whole world. Yeah. What it would do in relation to pretty much everybody. And it, it's very really cool. You must check it out. Um, and there was something else I want to say, but I've blanked on it. Okay, that's so the that segue. Brings us to a kicker, which is a no. We have we have DRM to talk about. I, I, I've yanked that out the show. We'll have to talk about it next time. <gasps> no, we'll have to there, talk about there it next time. was something Sorry. else I could add as well. Uh, we have our, I have my Raspberry Pi. I've played with it, and you can overclock it. <laughs> Sorry, that was that was the other thing I heard. <laughs> yeah, only geeks would overclock their Raspberry <laughs> Pi. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah, I love it. <laughs> overclock your Pi. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we we have a uh, triple kicker, it looks like. So um, the first one... <laughs> Be ready for the awesomeness. Robots. All right. What so, about robots? So what about robots, Tim? Um, somebody, you know, we keep on seeing all these robots going out and, you know, these cool things that robots can do. And everybody keeps on going, well, where's the robots I can actually use and buy and be inside? So one of the guys went built one. Um, it's Wait, got he built himself an Iron Man suit. You can buy these. How much? Uh, okay, several million. <laughs> Damn it. Obviously. No, but they fully, they're actually fully working. The, they even have like us in one of the videos where they, I think a kid pilots it, but it's got full, uh, several, mm. you know, what you call it, where the arms can move and legs can move. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have time to fully look at all the videos, but it's awesome. So you can actually climb inside and walk around in it. It's got a diesel generator to power it. Um, How long can cool. it go? I don't know. Hmm. Look, I don't think these are quite commercial army. The, these are for personal use, and um, it's got Hacking. like a BB gun that it can shoot out, an automated uh, Gatling BB gun or something like that. And I'm sure if they gave one of these to that fake Russian guy on YouTube, he the fake ga- Russian guy on YouTube. Oh yes, with yes, his massive guns. Um, um, I, I'm sure he'd hack something on there that's uh, real. a little more acceptable in terms of firepower. Yeah, so next kicker is a Lego engine. Okay, it's me, Esco. This is awesome. You've got to watch the video about it. Um, some guys basically build a jet turbine engine out of Lego. and Functional. Well, it's not, it's not going to... It's not uh, going to power a jet, but does the thing actually have moving parts? And fully, the, if you see, look at the thing that, like the thing that spin, spins there, it actually spins. And it's... Wow. They, they're separate. You've got different fans inside. And you can, actually, as you're doing, you can see they separately move. Um, so, uh, look, you don't see much movement, so I don't think it's designed to move a lot. But yeah, well, if it moves too fast, I'm sure that blocks would just yeah, start blocks flying. Yeah, blocks would just start flying yes. off. Um, I think they also use a bit of super glue to get everything <laughs> to keep the blocks together. They're uh, going with super glue is cheating. I'm just going to say that. If you're using super glue to keep your Lego model together, you are cheating. I think for this, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Watch the video. It is absolutely incredible what they do. If you and you're just looking at it, it looks like an engine out of Lego. It's amazing. <laughs> then uh, the uh, last, um, the, the last kicker for the day kicker. is Connect Hack turns body movements into the ultimate music mixer. This, this is quite cool. Um, the Connect. Uh, people have been using it to do everything except play games with it, which is <laughs> just fantastic. Um, this guy has taken the Connect, and it's also a video. Um, so click on the link, go watch that video. It's it's freaking awesome. Uh, and he's made he's taken a projector as well, projected it onto a wall, got his Connect hook up hooked up, and he's using body movements. But you know, o- as as only the Connect can, full on body movements, various types of hand gestures, and he's basically um, dirigir. What's the word I'm looking for? Conducting. Conducting. There we go. He's basically conducting music with all these gestures. Uh, and it's it's brilliant. It's a fantastic use of the Kinect. Uh, and it, it's just a really cool video. Um, have you guys have seen the new device that's supposed to be a Kinect replacement for your PC and stuff like that? It's supposed to be more compact and more... I think we spoke about it a, a couple of months ago, maybe. So that's going to be quite interesting. 
That, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of our show. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for watching. And uh, you can find me at YanVZA on Twitter. Uh, I also write for my broadband. That's actually where I spend most of my time. Tim, where can people find you? Uh, let's talk network. <laughs> all right. No, give, and at work. Given up on Twitter and, uh, and Google+. Plus. I, I, when I have more time. I, <laughs> uh, just, I, I need life to slow down. Kharat, where can people find you? About.me slash Hawkey ZA. Good you find stuff. all the wonderful accounts there. Um, remember to also email us with any kinds of uh, requests or if you've found something that we've said wrong and you want to correct us, do yeah, that it's too. Like, Lol, you are stupid at ltnet.tv. Let, let's rephrase it. When you find the things we have said wrong, there we go. you consider us corrections. Yes. Yes, yes. I, I know we have. And, just, and you can email anything at ltnet.tv. Um, yes. And it'll get to us. So um, if you have a particularly creative email address, we'll definitely make mention of that in the show. Cool. We, some, something like false at letstalknetwork.tv or wrong at Let's Talk Network. I, I think those are acceptable. Or, or Tim is wrong. Or Jan <laughs> is wrong. Or Gareth <laughs> is wrong. Indeed. Then we can filter on those and forward them to the right people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that could actually be pretty useful. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for, for joining us for the show. Go like us on Facebook, circle us in Google+, Plus, follow us on Twitter. Uh, in general, uh, insert uh, pandering and, uh, and bootlicking here so to, to get your likes and, uh, and so on and so forth. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, don't forget to join us next week and check out our other shows. Be aware we might... We're moving studios. If we're not here next week, we will tweet it. Just worry that the studio is not fully built by next week, Wednesday. Indeed. We are moving to House for Hack. If you've watched our previous show, previous two shows, I think uh, you'll, you'll know that. We announced that we're moving to House for Hack. We're fairly excited about that, but there's a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and yeah. I'd just like to thank Leif, uh, Leif Olaf again for joining us on the show. Uh, really appreciate uh, giving of your time uh, to, to come and chat to us. And, uh, and if, uh, if you'd like to hear more about uh, what Gartner has to say uh, about the, the IT space in general, uh, don't forget that uh, they're running an event at the end of August. I, I, I would love to actually, I don't have the time, and I'm sure it's going to cost quite a bit, but it would be quite interesting to actually listen to the big data time. stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, I know you were very interested in the big data stuff. I'm really trying to sign off the show here. Thank you very much. <laughs>